I wish to speak to you today about the tragedy of Europe. This noble continent comprising the fairest and the most cultivated regions of the earth, enjoying a, a temperate and equable climate, is the home of all the great parent races of the Western world. It is the fountain of Christian faith and Christian ethics. It is the origin of most of the culture, the arts, philosophy, and science, both of ancient and modern times. If Europe were once united in the sharing of its common inheritance, there would be no limit to the happiness, to the prosperity and the glory which its three or four hundred million people would enjoy. This is the Europe of today, two decades after Sir Winston Churchill's plea for unity. A Europe reborn, rebuilt, humming with life, prosperous, peaceful. But prosperity and peace need safeguards, now more than ever. Our world is a world of giants. In it, Europe can no longer afford to be divided to meet the challenge of size and to make her own voice heard. She must unite. United Europe began with six countries. For centuries, they'd been divided by barriers to trade, by barriers to the movement of money and to the movement of people. Like all great ideas, the plan was simple. Abolish the barriers, for today, they no longer make sense. A start was made with coal and steel. In Luxembourg, the European coal and steel community established its high authority, an executive body to pool in one unit the coal and steel of six nations. Now, for coal and steel, the barriers have been abolished. Six years later came Euratom, the European Atomic Energy Community, to build a peaceful atomic industry in which all could work as one. The same year, the idea was extended to establish a common market for all goods and services. By 1970, perhaps earlier, all the economic barriers between these countries will have gone. Goods, money and people will be able to move freely. The community will act as one. Hello, EWG Brüssel. Mit wem möchten Sie sprechen, bitte? Hello, yes, common market, Brüssel. Yes, one moment, please. Quite a lot of people come here to Brussels to find out about the common market. You mustn't think of us as a bunch of super bureaucrats lording it over Europe. Essentially, we're part of a democratic structure. For the most part, we don't take decisions ourselves. That's the job of the Council of Ministers. One minister from each member state. They meet here about once a month. The Council works on proposals from the Commission, our bosses. There are nine commissioners, appointed jointly by the member states, but once appointed, they're independent. The Commission is responsible for the European Parliament. So far, this is chiefly an advisory body, but there are plans to give it greater powers. Finally, the Court of Justice is the community's Court of Appeal. It interprets our Constitution rather like the Supreme Court of the United States. These are the institutions set up by the Treaty of Rome. Decisions taken under it have the force of law in all the member states. Building a new Europe isn't simple. You can't cancel past disunity with a single stroke of the pen. There must be meetings, discussions, conferences, and a great deal of hard work. For example, the common market had to work out a single level of customs duties on all goods coming into the community. 
the six countries started with 26,000 different customs categories. To use them all would have led to fantastic complications. They had to be simplified and they had to be agreed. The documents involved, the tariffs of six countries, were packed in special containers and the monster, as they called it, travelled from capital to capital. There were endless conferences and pretty heated debates. In Brussels, the findings of a thousand meetings were translated, were argued over, amended and finally agreed. With patience and goodwill, they reduced the documents to one volume of 6,000 items. It looks simple now, but it was a colossal piece of work. In ways like this, a few hundred of Europe's ablest men are trying to weld six economies into one. Absolument résoudre ce problème qui n'est pas prévu par le traité. Que peut-on faire? La meilleure solution, à mon avis, consiste. The immense strides which have been made are due to them and to the exceptional caliber of the men who have served, created, and interpreted the community idea. Men like Monet, Schumann, and Hallstein. Internal trade has risen by 73% in four years, a fantastic increase. But how? What exactly have you done? I'll give you an example from the coal and steel community, which has been running now for 10 years. Much of Europe's heavy industry is concentrated in one small area. Northeastern France, northwestern Germany, Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. This workshop of Europe was crisscrossed by frontiers. Now the community has abolished them. The steel plants of the different countries, rebuilt and modernized, can now work and compete together. In Italy, many steelworks were becoming obsolete. Sooner or later, they would have had to modernize in order to compete. The coal and steel community has helped them to do it. Here in Genoa, some 10,000 people live and live well from the extra work that modernization has brought. In fact, more skilled men are wanted than the town can supply, so more are being trained. Flats have been built to house them. 12,000 more will go up in the next few years. In Genoa, the community has brought more jobs and a bright future. But what about the other side of the coin? The darker side. For example, in the Borinage district of Belgium, more than three quarters of the coal mines have been closed. The coal seams are poor, the machinery old, the coal too dear. With demand shrinking, it was impossible to save these pits. In some regions, almost the entire working population was out of a job. Here again, the European community has come to the rescue with retraining programs and financial aid. For a year, the miners draw full pay while they and their families are being helped to build a better future. With special funds, new industries are encouraged to move in and take up the slack. Special allowances go to the families who move into these new homes. This was once fertile land. Europe's farms have been and still are the community's biggest single headache. In many places, the daily struggle with exhausted land is mocked by gluts of food elsewhere. This is not just a European problem. The world over, there's been the grim paradox of overproduction and starvation. In the community, as elsewhere, conflicting national policies have put the real solutions out of reach. Now, for the community at least, a single united policy has been mapped out. Food must be plentiful, at reasonable prices that everyone can pay. Farmers' incomes must no longer lag behind. All this means change. At last, technology and capital are going into the land. Still nowhere near enough, but it's a start. In Italy and France, 
vast irrigation schemes are underway. Pumping stations such as this, the biggest in Europe, bring water from the River Rhone to the high plains above. Now, water brings fertility to once barren land, fertility and abundant crops. Old, inefficient small holdings have been merged. Some land has been retired. New acres have been reclaimed. These crops come from 400,000 acres of land that was once completely arid. Now it's one of the most fertile plains of France. The same in Italy. The same in Holland. Like all other goods within the community, farm produce will soon move freely from country to country, free of national barriers, free of delay. For the world, the community is one of the biggest markets for farm produce. It intends to maintain these vast established links of trade to help the world's producers as it puts its own house in order. Change is coming to the countryside. No one ever claimed that it could all be done at once. But out of depression, new hope is being born. Take Italy. This southern village is picturesque, but desperately poor. Now, new industries are being brought here to provide work locally. Things are beginning to look up. It still isn't enough. But in the north of Italy, and in other community countries, there's a shortage of manpower, particularly skilled men. Here in the south, the new jobs are advertised. If jobs are vacant, men can cross the frontiers to take them. In 1962, German factories had jobs for 10,000 extra men. Holland had jobs for a thousand. More still will be needed as industry expands. Unskilled men are trained for new tasks. When qualified, they get the same pay and protection as everyone else. They have an equal right to flats and houses, just like the people at whose side they work. They keep full pension rights and full insurance benefits. For the newcomers, life can be pleasant. A solid job, a decent flat, money in the bank, and time to relax. <laughs> After five years in the new country, the newcomer has the right to leave his job, to work in any trade he chooses, or to set up on his own. For he is a full citizen, not just of his own country, but of the community as a whole. Of course, many people save their money and finally go back home. For even now, industry is moving into their own regions. Already, wages in the community are leveling upwards. But the principle has been accepted. The right to work anywhere within the community, wherever jobs are waiting. It all takes time and thought. Here in Brussels, old problems are solved and new challenges are taken up. This is the threshold of the atomic age. At a dozen different places throughout the community, under the guidance of Euratom, atomic science for peaceful purposes is making giant strides. It has to. For 15 years from now, Europe's total power needs will be enormous. Through your atom, money, brains and results are shared in common. No one country by itself could afford the research, development and training that this giant task involves. Your atom scientists believe that atomic power can be made to pay its way within 10 years. At Ispra in Italy, one of the first your atom research centers is now nearing completion. 1,500 scientists from all over the community will work here.
investigation ranges from almost pure mathematics to methods of decontaminating radioactive material. Already, some of their research is seen elsewhere. In industry, atomic power will drive ships now on the drawing board. In medicine, atomic science fights cancer. Top scientists from all over the community now work together and learn to live together. That in itself is just as important as the knowledge they bring or come to receive. Their children, like many others, are being taught together in special European schools, in all the languages of the community. Here, among the children, the European idea is taking root, establishing a pattern for the future. A future when differences of language and custom are no longer a barrier to understanding and friendship. The universities of the community temper scientific and technical knowledge with the wisdom of an older culture. Europe is not just seeking technocrats, but human beings men and women who accept the fact that the community in which they live and work is daily becoming closer-knit with common ideals and common cause. The European community is fast becoming a full reality. The results are there for all to see. We know that big problems remain. Booms and slumps, poverty and disease, political tensions, ignorance and fear. All these are challenges on a world scale. But here in Europe, something new is emerging. The community exists and it works. Other countries may join it. Now it can take its place among its friends and allies in a partnership of equals. Already it represents a new form of international life, hopeful but practical. A new method that may someday lead towards a peaceful and a united world.